We're so thankful that you've chosen to join with us this morning as we celebrate another Lord's Day. And you know, I don't know about you, but I, I'm missing the fellowship. I'm missing the opportunity to be able to be with my brothers and sisters, to be able to get the hugs and, and all those things that we enjoy so much. And, and I, I do believe, I, I'll say this, I do believe that there's sometime in the very near future that we're going to be able to come together again. And what a day that's going to be in the house of the Lord. We're all able to come together and again enjoy the company of each other. But this morning I'm going to go with you to the Gospel of Luke in the 24th chapter, uh, beginning at verse 36. And the Bible says, And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted, and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he saith unto them, Why are you troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, or look at my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wonder, he said unto them, Have you any meat? And they gave him a piece of a broiled fish and a honeycomb. And he took it and did eat before them. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was wet yet with you, that all these things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remissions of sins should be preached in his name among all the nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Father, we thank you again this morning and praise you for the privilege that we have to be gathered together. And we pray now, Lord, that for a moment in time you would hide us behind the cross, revelate our mind and loosen our tongues. And God, I pray that not one word that I speak would originate from within me. But Lord, it would originate in the very throne room of glory. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, you would present it. And I pray, God, that you would give each one that hears a heart to be able to receive it. And we'll thank you by faith right now for what your word will accomplish. In the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. And amen and amen. You know, we just come through celebrating uh, the Easter season, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as they think about this, I know as we move toward Easter, there's always a, a slow move, a slow uh, go as we go towards Easter. And then whenever Easter's over with it, sometimes we we'll wonder, well, what do we do now? Where do we go from here? But this morning, for just a moment in time, I want to look at Jesus Christ as we have celebrated his resurrection. And so many times, whether we think in our mind that Jesus was resurrected, that he went back to heaven, and there he was able to take a, a well-deserved rest, a well-deserved break, to enjoy the fellowship and the reunion time with his Father. But in actuality, according to the Scriptures, Jesus spent another 40 days on earth. And I know as we go back in John's Gospel, chapter 17, verse 4 and 5, Jesus said, I, I finished the work that thou gavest me. Now, O Father, glorify thou me with the glory which I had with thee from the foundation of the world. We know as we look and understand the Scriptures that Jesus had a great desire to return back to the Father. And yet he tarried his coming. He tarried his going back to the Father for a period of 40 days. Why? Why did Jesus tarry his return? Well, 
out of this text this morning, we'll look at just a couple of things. First of all, in verse 36, I believe Jesus stayed for the purpose of encouraging the church. The Bible says, And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said unto him, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted, and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? In John's account of this same version, he says in John 20, 19, on the same day, at evening, so on the same day, what was it referring to? On resurrection Sunday. So this is later on, on Sunday afternoon, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And there the Bible says the disciples were assembled together for fear of the Jews. So here we have a picture of this group of men that Jesus Christ had invested the last three plus years of his life, his time and energy spent in preparing these men for the coming mission that they would do. And here as we look at this, Jesus Christ is coming and now, if you will, the mission of Jesus Christ appears to be in danger. Now, as we think about what Jesus Christ came for, and we think about, well, now, his mission was finished whenever he died on the cross of Calvary. In John 19, 30, the Bible says, it is finished. And that is true, but it's only part of the truth. The redemptive mission of Jesus Christ, the plan to redeem man, the atoning sacrifice that was needed to be made, was complete at the cross of Calvary. Nothing could be added to, nothing could be taken away from God's salvation plan. It was Calvary and Calvary alone that provided the means and the avenue whereby you and I may be able to have eternal life. So yes, the mission of Jesus Christ as far as the redemption that he was talking about in Genesis 3.15 when he said to the serpent, he said, I put enmity between thee and the seed of the woman and listen, Satan, you shall bruise his heel but he shall bruise or crush your head. Yes, that part of his mission was complete. But yet there was also another aspect to the mission of Jesus Christ. In Matthew's Gospel chapter 16, we see Jesus again talking to these same 11 disciples that we read about here in Luke 24 and 36. And Jesus approaches them and he says, Who do men say that I am? And they said, Well, you're Jeremiah or Elijah or one of the prophets. And Jesus yelled, and I ask you, Who do you say that I am? And Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonas, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And upon this rock, upon this confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So a part of Jesus' mission that was not yet complete was the establishment of the church. Now, Jesus Christ was leaving in the hands of these 11 men, really, the church, the, the future of the church was invested in these 11 men. And now, fear has overcome them. And Jesus' mission of building a church seems to be in danger. In fact, this mission, the Bible says in the book of Revelation chapter 19, the Bible speaks of the bride of Christ. It speaks the marriage of the Lamb is ready and the bride or the, is preparing herself. Now, the church that we're talking about, the church that Jesus Christ came to, to build was actually one day going to become the bride of Christ. So now, this is all seems to be in danger. It all seems to be that this could come under unraveled around the edges because God did not have plan B. God did not have any other plan to build the church. These 11 men was God's plan. And Jesus Christ stayed here on earth to encourage him because now a church cannot be built on fear. The Bible says without faith it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So now this church was actually in danger of not even getting off the ground. And Jesus Christ is staying 
Savior to encourage them, to encourage them in their faith. And as we look on for just a moment, how then did Jesus Christ stir up their faith? What did he do? How did he encourage them in order to have the fear overcome by faith? Well, we look on down in verse 40, and the Bible says, and when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. Now, as these disciples were there hiding in fear, fear for the Roman government, fear that their lives would be taken, and this was a reality. This was a real fear. Because at the time that the Roman government and the Sanhedrin court, the religious established, the time they got together to destroy Jesus Christ, that was a reality. The disciples had a just right to be afraid. But now Jesus Christ is coming to them and he's trying to encourage them. As we look here in the word of God, listen, the Bible says again that when he listened, he showed them his hands and feet. Now, they did not have the privilege, they did not have the opportunity to be able to go and open up the Bible. The Bible says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. They didn't have an opportunity to open up the Bible and read in there where it says, Jesus and I am the resurrection of the life. He that liveth and believeth me, though he were dead, yet shall he live again. They didn't have the privilege to read Revelation chapter 12 where the Bible says and they overcame him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb of the word of their testimony. They didn't have the opportunity to read the writings of the Apostle Paul who said the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of an archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first and those of us which are alive and remain shall be caught up in the air to meet the Lord and so shall we ever be with the Lord. They didn't have the opportunity to go into the word and read these things that would encourage them, that would allow them to know that one day there's victory in Jesus Christ. They had no written word. So what Jesus Christ did, since they didn't have the written word, since they didn't have the Bible, what he did was he came to them as the living word. John said, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And verse 14 the Bible says, and the word was with flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Yes, Jesus Christ stayed behind to encourage the church, to encourage the disciples. He gave them the living word. He gave them the living word. He gave them evidence. He gave them proof. He gave them something to base their faith on. And I'm glad today as we live in this world that we've got the word of God to base our faith upon. And you know what today, he, the same as it was when the disciples came, whenever Jesus was talking to them. I feel like today sometimes that the church is in danger of hiding in fear. I feel like sometimes the church is in danger of allowing fear to overcome faith because I'm going to tell you we as a church cannot operate in fear because where there is fear faith cannot operate. And listen to me, the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, the Bible says this know also that in the last days perilous or dangerous times shall come for men shall be lovers of their own self, covetous, Bolsters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fears, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high minded, lovers of pleasures, more of God, having the form of godless, but not denying the power thereof. You know, today, as we look around in this world, you know what it looks like that we're losing. It's looked like the devil's got everything under control. It it looks like the church is going down in defeat. But I'm telling you, as we look in the Word of God, see, now we have, because Jesus Christ went to those disciples, because He encouraged them, because He stirred up their faith and gave them the faith to be able to go out and lay their lives down in order to establish the church. And you know what? It's because of these men that Jesus Christ went to that we have this Word. They were 
the writers this word. The Bible says that scriptures are not given of any private interpretation, but they were given to men of old as the Holy Ghost moved upon them. I'm telling you, this word right here that we have, it's inspired with God. It was written by some of these very same men that Jesus Christ went to that day to stir up their faith. And now that we have a word today, today the living word, Jesus Christ, is not going to come to Wooten, Kentucky, or anyone else. He's not going to come and he's not going to stand here and show us his hands and show us his feet. But he's given us the living word. It's just as if he is here. This word is just as real as if Jesus Christ spoke it himself. It's just as relevant. It don't change because it's on the pages of a book. And here the Bible says Jesus has given us something. He said, I'm telling you, rather than give up today, rather than show up, throw up your hands, rather than be in fear. And I know today this church seems to be in some kind of a disarray. And I know this, this virus that we're dealing with in our nation, I know that it's got people, it's got people operating in fear. But I'm telling you, Jesus Christ said in the gospel of Matthew chapter 24, as he gave some of the end time signs. And one of the end time signs was this, that there shall be pestilence coming. And I tell you, I call this a pestilence. That's what this is. It could be this may very well be one of the signs of the end time. And rather than get all tore up, rather than throw up our hands and give up, we ought to raise our hands up and shout praises unto God. And your word is becoming fulfilled every day. And I've got more faith. The more I see, the more trouble we face, the more tribulation that we go through. I'm telling you, that is just confirmation of what God said. For you know the last days, perilous, difficult, dangerous times are coming. We're living in the midst of dangerous times. And I'm telling you without a shadow of a doubt, we cannot operate in fear. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ must stand up and be counted for. We must stand up and be strong. This is the day the Lord has made. I will be glad and rejoice in it. The Word of God assures me that this is not the end. This is not the defeat. This is absolutely a part of God's plan in the end times. Jesus Christ came. He came to these disciples to encourage their faith. And I'm coming to you today to encourage your faith. This is not the end. Don't be discouraged. Don't think that the church is going down to feet. I know the church has lost some of its influence. And I know their scandals seem like all over the place in the church world. But I'm telling you, Jesus Christ came to the disciples. He showed them His hands. He showed them His feet. He said, have faith, have faith, have a life, have a life. And I'm saying to you today, through the Word of God, He's saying to you and I, have have faith. Have faith. Don't give up. Everything is going to be all right. Time is coming when the church, you know what? The church one day, you and I, the blood bond, blood washed, again according to Revelation chapter 19, where it says the marriage of the Lamb is come and the bride is making herself ready. You know what? We're going to get married again, church. We're going to be the bride of Christ. You may say, I ain't never going to get married you will get married if you're a child of God. You're going to be the bride of Christ. And Jesus Christ, as he came back to the disciples, as he showed them his hands, as he showed them his feet, he was, if you will, he was doing this so that you and I would have an opportunity today to be a part of this glorious church, a part of the bride that he himself was established. But again, as Jesus Christ is getting ready to leave, he says, you know what? I've got to take a little extra time. I've got to stay here for just a few more days. I need to encourage my disciples. I need to stir up their faith. And I'll tell you today, if you're getting discouraged, if you feel like defeat's coming your way, listen, the Bible teaches me again that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. If you're discouraged, if you feel like you're defeated, I challenge you. I challenge you. Open up the Word of God. Read the Word of God. Read the, take 15 minutes and read the Word of God. And I'll tell you what, you'll feel faith begin to stir up on the inside of you. Jesus Christ stayed. One reason he stayed was to encourage the faith, to stir them up, that they wouldn't give up, that they wouldn't throw in the towel. Now in verse 44, 
we see Jesus stayed, I believe, to enlighten the church. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was wet yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. In order for the church to sail out totally to Jesus Christ, they needed to know that the authority that he was giving them was legitimate. They needed to know that they had the resources of heaven behind them. And the Bible says he went through the script. He went from Genesis to Malachi, which was the extent of the prophecy, with the extent of the scriptures in the day of Jesus. He went from Genesis to Malachi, and he began to open up their understanding. What was his purpose? He was to, really trying to show them that he fulfilled every requirement that God had laid down. You go all the way back to Genesis 3.15 that I mentioned a while ago. And then you could go through the Psalms where he said, For meat they gave me gone, and for my thirst they gave me vinegar. We read there where it said, and not a bone was broken. And as we read in the story of the resurrection of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, again, when, when the soldiers came to Jesus, the Bible says they break not his leg. Why? That the scriptures may be fulfilled, that not a bone be broken. Jesus is taking these scriptures and he is showing them he's opened up their eyes of understanding so they'll know beyond a shadow of a doubt that he met every qualification that he met every requirement Isaiah said his visage would be marred more than any man Isaiah said that he would be born of a virgin and he may would call Emmanuel he go all through the scriptures and all these prophecies that are concerning Jesus Christ he opens up their understanding he opens up their minds and allows them to understand that Jesus Christ perfectly fulfilled every qualification. He fulfilled everything that God had demanded that Jesus Christ do. And why? So that they may be able to act without fear. The church, the disciples need to know that Jesus Christ was the one that had the authority and the power that he was qualified to be able to give them what they need. Why? Because Jesus had made a great demand of them. In Matthew 16, 24, Jesus said, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake shall find it. And again, this teaching in Matthew chapter 16 is to the same 11 disciples that he's talking to here in Luke chapter 24. And Jesus tells him, You know, this is what I'm asking of you. This is what I'm demanding of you. You've got to sell out to me. You've got to turn your life over to me. You know, the thing about sometimes that we don't understand is that whenever we come to the Lord Jesus, I know many times we come because we're afraid of dying and going to hell. Or maybe we come because our life is falling apart and we're looking for some kind of magic answer, something to put our homes back together, to put our lives back together. But when we come to Jesus Christ, this is what Jesus said. Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you've got to give up your right to direct your life. You've got to sell out to me. And this is what Jesus Christ, as he came to the disciples, he wants them to know that if they're going to sell out their lives, that they're not making a bad deal. That they, and he has the right, he has the power to fulfill every promise that he made to them. And I thought about this, as Jesus Christ came to the disciples, if he is going to really demand that they give up their life, Paul said like this, you're not your own, you're bought with the price. And you know what? That still is in place for you and I in the church today. I believe for you and I to sell out our lives. We have to be convinced, persuaded in our own hearts that Jesus Christ is who he says it is. You know what? For the past 35 years or so of my life, I've been trying to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And for the last 30 years of it, I've spent preaching the gospel. And you know what? I've had to sell out my life. I've had to give up things. I've had to sacrifice things. But you know what? The reason I was able to do that was because 
I believe that Jesus Christ fulfilled every qualification. I believe he had the right to say, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He had that right. I am the resurrection of the life. He that liveth and believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus said, if I would believe, I would not perish, but have everlasting life. And I believe that. I was willing to sell out my life to Jesus Christ. And I do believe that for you and I, for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ today, in order to sell out our life, in order to do what we need to do, we have to be fully convinced in our heart that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, the only one, the only way to the glory land of our Father. Jesus Christ. He's the only one. He's the only way. You know what? I thought about it with an analogy. I thought about how if I was getting ready to invest my life savings, if I was getting ready to invest everything that I had in a piece of property, let me ask you something. Would you, if that was you, would you give your money, your life savings, your retirement, would you give it all to somebody else? Unless you had a lawyer or some person that was authorized to search that deed, to make sure that the owner that you was trying to buy it from had the right and the authority to declare it yours. No, you wouldn't. Well, Jesus Christ stayed here for the purpose of assuring the disciples and ultimately you and I, the church, that he had the authority, he had the authority and the power to fulfill every promise that he made. I look at it from this way. Think about this. On the cross, on the cross, Jesus Christ made a deal. On the cross, Jesus Christ Sign the title deed to my eternal life. On resurrection morning, God notarized it. The, notar the notarization simply says, when you notarize something, the person that has the power or the authority to notarize is the one who actually has the power and the authority of the state or whatever it may be behind them. They're backing them. So God, as Jesus signed my right to eternal life on the cross and on resurrection morning, God notarized it. God made it official. And God deemed that what Jesus Christ offered, He now has the right to provide. And He, God Almighty, who has all power both in heaven and earth, has said Jesus Christ is who He claims to be. And I'm telling you this morning, the church needs to be assured. The church needs to know beyond a shadow of a doubt. You know what I would hate to think? That I have invested over half of my life, well over half of my life, I have invested in the service of the Lord. And to think that it would all be for naught, for nothing, wasted, vain. But I'm telling you, Jesus Christ stayed to assure the disciples that what he had promised, he was able to fulfill. I think about all those people who are looking to some other way, whether it be Muhammad or Buddha, the New Age philosophies, whatever it may be, whatever way that you have chosen to have an access to God, to have a hope of eternal life, may I ask you this, has God Almighty, has He notarized your hope. Has he notarized your way? I'm, I must tell you this morning, the only way that God has put his seal of approval on you is Jesus Christ. There is no other way. There is no other hope. Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. 
And therefore, as that comes to pass, the Bible says in Matthew 16, 17, but go back just to or Mark 16, 17, and these signs shall follow them that believe in my name, shall they cast it devil. They shall speak with new tongues, and they shall take up serpents. Because Jesus Christ, he came, he enlightened these disciples. He gave them an understanding that he had the ability to fulfill, to produce what he had promised. He met every qualification. Now he told them, and he's telling you and I, we can go out with confidence. And we can operate in and under the name of Jesus Christ. And we can do so with assurance. Let me say to you this morning, if you're listening, and you've never come to know Jesus Christ, and a free pardon and remission of sins. If you've never come to know Jesus Christ as your very own personal Lord and Savior, I want you to know that right now, right now, there is a title deed to your eternal salvation in the portals of glory waiting for you to reach out and accept it. And I can assure you upon the authority of God's word, if you will by faith reach out to Jesus Christ and say, Oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I promise you that that deed that's up there will be brought out. Jesus Christ will sign it. God will notarize it. And from that point on, you will have eternal life. Jesus Christ stayed behind 40 days. Why? To, in a brief summary, he stayed by 40 days to ensure that you and I, today, in 2020, have an opportunity to be saved, an opportunity to receive eternal life. If you don't know Jesus Christ, I pray that today will be that day. And if you will, by faith, reach out to him, Please let somebody know. Let us know. Let a family member, let a friend know. Call somebody and tell them that Jesus Christ has saved your soul. And give glory and praise and honor to Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you this morning for the privilege that we've had to once again bring your word. We pray now, Lord, that you take this simple, feeble effort, that you will empower it and use it for your glory, for your honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.